everybody. Welcome back to the Earth on Survival Guide, the podcast for all disciplines, paths, players, and game masters. With your questers, Josh and Dan, I'm Dan. I'm Josh. And on today's podcast, we'll be discussing all things Shosarical, because we're going to actually break down the history and foundation of the other elven city to the north, Shosara. So if you have any questions for us about anything at all, please contact us at edsgpodcast at gmail.com. We still need a couple of emails to go through uh, for Fredonia Con, weekend of February the 18th for our episode. The Fredonia Con, I think, begins on that Friday the 16th, goes to the 17th and 18th. We are having our live episode on the 18th, so that's when we need them by. Yeah, this episode is the last one that's going to drop before that weekend. Yep. Happy Valentine's Day, Dan. Happy Valentine's Day, Josh. Love you, man. That's the day that this episode drops, February 14th. So yeah, if you are listening to this on the day it drops or very soon thereafter, there is still time to get an email to us for us to have at FredoniaCon. Yes. Or even to come and check out the live show that Sunday in the Facet Games Discord. Links, as always, in our show notes. Yes. So if you are dozens of episodes behind, you're out of luck. If you are dozens of episodes behind, uh, then when you get caught up, you will hear the, I mean, by the time you, yeah, anyway, 2024 is when that is happening. If it is after February 2024, then that Fredonia Con has already happened. Yes. The episode is in the feed. The recording should be on the YouTube channel. Tell us how we did. Anyway, so show We did awesome, Dan. I will tell you that now. Absolutely. We're always awesome. Uh, So Shosara, the city is the crown jewel of the Northern Kingdom, and it is built on a pe- in a peninsula, always a word I have trouble saying, into the Gwyn Sea. The other th- major factor about Shosara, before we get to everything else, is the point I want the, the point I need to, to highlight is that the citadel of Shosara during the scourge was not breached. That is a cool thing. Slightly different take. There's been a lot of breached things in Nerthon over the years. Parlane screwed up. I think even Trevar had a couple of break-ins, if unless I'm remembering that incorrectly. However, Shosara was not breached. But the cool thing about Shosara, to begin with, is it was founded by those who intentionally set out to explore what lay over the horizon. This tale of elvish ex- exploration reminds people that the elves were built ex- built to explore. That's in their nature. And so... They are at odds with the Bloodwood, Wormwood, because Wormwood wants to be isolationist and stay within themselves. And these elves remind everybody, no, we were meant to be wanderers and explorers. That's the elven job. Those of you who are staying in Bloodwood are betraying that part of yourselves. It's in your nature to explore. So they were inspired by a divine vision of Jasper after the creation of Oakheart to go explore what lay over the horizon. This is where Shosara came from. This was the foundational belief and ideal that built Shosara to the north. Yes. And for those of you who are interested in the real world parallel geography. Ooh, I am. Yeah. Shosara is a peninsula that pokes out, as you said, into the Gwyn Sea. The Gwyn Sea is the Earth Dawn equivalent of the White Sea, which ah. is the small little inlet off of the Barents Sea, south of the, pretty sure it's Skin Finland. No, sorry, near Finland. Ah. It is actually still part of Russia. But if you like are familiar with the... Finland, Sweden, Norway section up there. There's Mm -hmm. a football bit that comes off of the eastern side of that. That's Russian, and that kind of is the northern edge of the White Sea. And there's a channel, fairly wide channel, Mm -hmm. that goes northeast out of there, out into the Barents Sea, which is basically part of the Arctic Ocean. Cool. And yeah, we uh, the... Elven Nation's book actually does include lovely maps. Yes, thank you, Jeff. Orient all, yeah, to help orient uh, anybody who's viewing. Because when, as I was reading this entire section, I was like, right, where is this again? So I had to go to take a look at the maps because I'm very visual and that works for me. And if you look, it's not again, not exactly one to one. You can put the one on top of the other, but yeah. the shapes are close enough 
that you can mm-hmm. take a look at it and then look at a map of the part of the world that I was just describing and go, oh, OK, yeah. that's yeah. where it is. Mm-hmm. So we've kind of uh, settled the geography a little bit. Uh, initial thoughts on what led these elves out to explore and or how at odds they are with the thought process of the Bloodwood. Well, I don't think that the initial motivations, I don't think that the initial journeys away from Wormwood mm-hmm. were where the division arose. Oh, I agree. think that the court would have been perfectly willing for them to be a vassal state, as mm-hmm. it were, to the greater elven court in a similar way that the that Seriatha and the Western kingdoms are. Yeah. In terms of that cultural connection where the elves of Shosara set out from Wormwood, they were from Wormwood. Mm-hmm. The divisions came along later. Agreed. As is described in several earlier histories of Barsave and, and the Wood. Yeah. In that the elves of Shosara did not feel the need to maintain the purity of elvish culture in terms of their designs and stuff, in terms of yeah. how things worked. Agreed. They were in a different environment, a different mm-hmm. climate, and so needed to adapt to the realities of their situation. And the best way to do that was to learn from the other people that were from that area and had already adapted and learned some things in terms of how to deal with the particulars of where they lived and how it all supported or did not support them in various ways. Absolutely. So I misspoke a little bit to your point, which is I kind of mixed up the timeline as to what, as to how these Shosaran elves got their foundation and the schism that happened between them and the Bloodwood elves. You are correct. That happened later on. I mixed those two together. So wanted to clarify for all the listeners, my fault. Anyway, uh, this was this, this quest out of the Bloodwood uh, to eventually where Shosara ended up, was headed by a quester of Jaspri. Jaspri plays a lot into the Shosara and elves. Nazrana was the quester of Jaspri. She led the expedition and eventually became the first ruler because she did such a good job. And as I said, Jaspri plays, plays very heavily into all of this. And to what Josh alluded to just a few minutes ago is when they started founding Shosara, they found that they ended on the peninsula that the, they loved the sea. It was more open than the bloodwood because there's some trees. Yes. There's forest there. Yes. Less of it. So they had more room to expand, more room to breathe philosophically speaking. And then they started branching out again. Once they found their home base that became Shosara, they expanded out a little bit and just started exploring what else is around you. That's what you do when you move to a new place. And they eventually found a human settlement to the east, because it was pretty much untamed in every other direction. So they said, well, there's nothing here. But eastward, they did come across a human settlement called Kistova. Very Russian sounding, just, just to say. And after some reluctance between both of these uh, kind of wary, trepidatious parties, uh, trade was finally initiated and a bond began to form between the elves and the humans. Now, other races live there, there's some dwarves and so forth and so on, but predominantly elves in Shosara, predominantly humans in Kistova. Yes. And the Kistovans, the humans there, were a seafaring people after their own fashion. The climate up that far north is unforgiving. Yes. Resources are in some ways scarce. Mm hmm. Timber and wood and things like that are reasonably plentiful, Mm -hmm. particularly evergreens and such because of how far north they are. Yeah. And there is some wildlife, but the bulk of the Kistovan society was sort of survived on fishing and sea trade. It's yeah. located at the mouth of a river that empties into the Gwyn Sea. Mm-hmm. 
So the people that had grown up there and, and lived there for generations, certainly farther back than any of their histories, it's a sense of they had kind of always been there, would make their living off of the sea and the bounty that it could provide. And I imagine as well, given the area, if you want to take some kind of historical real world inspirations, you kind of look at stuff like the the Laplanders and other indigenous peoples of that northern region. Yeah. Who, you know, make their living like with herding caribou and reindeer. Mm-hmm. Reindeer, I think, more in that part of the world. I think caribou are a North American. Sounds right. They're related. They're sort of similar animals, but mm-hmm. fishing and, and such as well. One of the, at least as sort of the things are set up in Earth Dawn, the Gwyn Sea is somewhat sheltered. It doesn't mm-hmm. suffer from the nasty storms that you get when you venture out into what they call the Sea of Ice. That is the yeah. present day Arctic Ocean. Yeah. Because you've got the landmass of the Scandinavian peninsula off to the West Mm -hmm. and the mountains that are there that kind of help moderate a lot of the nastier storms that would come across. And so it is a little bit more habitable in some regards, although it is still overall a kind of unforgiving area, especially in the winters. Yes. The wind sea has a lot of, uh, not necessarily storms, but wind and so uh, it is said in the, the essay that a capable captain and, a, and a, a worthy crew can get anywhere they want to in the Gwyn Sea in four days if they yeah. know how to do the winds just right. Otherwise, it'll take a week. So one of those things. Anyway, so Kistova was ruled by a prince, but all of Kistova had a kind of a quasi-democratic political body going on. And Shosara ended up adapt, adopting some of... Kistova's political practices, as far as that was concerned, more power to the people, more voice of the people. And Kistova adopted some elven practices of con- of woodland conservation and uh, earthen spirituality. So they began to blend their cultures together a little bit. And they worked together to build some seafaring ships, not just river boats, because again, Kistova lies at the mouth of the river. They built mostly flat bottom boats because the Kistova River is very placid and calm all the way northward because the, the water travels to the northwest a little bit and uh, lets out into the sea there. So they were very, very handy at building ships of both kinds. Working together, Shosara and Kistova built uh, a lot of seafaring ships to harness the abundant true elements that are in this region. A lot of true water, a lot of true wood, a lot of true air to the even the east of Kistova. And uh, this cooperation with the humans and the adoption of their social and political practices led to the elven court at Wormwood excommunicating Shosara at this point. Yeah, the elves of Shosara brought with them their elven crafts and culture and the ships that the elves used to be known for building. This is prior to the big drag out that the elves in the Tuscrang had, where the Tuscrang essentially dominated the Mm -hmm. elven boats, the elven ships on the Serpent River. And so aside from a few smaller vessels that are used on the Mothingale rivers of Bloodwood. I think there's one elven vessel that now is relegated to the Aras Sea. Yeah, I think so. The elves of Shosara brought that tradition with them to the north, but found that the hazards of the Gwyn Sea were not ideal conditions for their ships to Mm -hmm. work in. And so they needed to combine their craftsmanship and shipbuilding knowledge with the information and the experience that the humans of Kostova had for navigating the Gwyn Sea. And so you have this hybrid where you've got the elven craftsmanship coupled with the humans' practicality and ability to deal with this unique environment The elven court, being what it is, was not happy with what the more 
tight laced of them considered as as a corruption of the elven traditions and the elven mm-hmm. practices. Yeah. No outsiders, darn it. Can't have any of that. Can't mix the breeds and races together. So a lot of a lot of um seclusionist, isolationist and anti going on. Uh so this all was is heaped upon Queen Phyla at the time, who was very new to the throne when all this took place. And was so incensed, she heaped insult upon insult on the Lariscova Rinell, which is pretty much uh, who was in charge of Shosara, and the specifically the matriarch of the Lariscova Rinell, and that is Ariane. So when the <laughs> this got turned around a little bit. So what happened was the Lariscova Rinell was going to bring evidence of Queen Phyla's favoritism and impropriety to the court and cast aspersions back on her since she was heaping insults upon them. Uh, They were there to defend themselves a little bit and say, look, you're, you're doing a whole lot of favoritism to a certain Rennell or two here and there, and it's not us. So uh, just step off a little bit. Um, The surprising move is Queen Phyla abdicated the throne right then and there. Yes. The strain of this philosophical division in the Elven court led to the Lariscova Rennell, which was the dominant Rennell in Shosara, putting together their case and building allies to, for lack of a better term, to move against the queen. Yeah, fair. To basically fair. say that the queen was playing favorites and not representing all Elvendom as she claimed to. Yeah. She abdicated. Mm-hmm. I'm going to step back a bit and I'm going to talk about my favorite <laughs> subject. <laughs> which is well queen queen Liara, Liara, queen, queen, queen Liara was next and actually did the ban did the uh banishment. right so, but but anyway yes here is my read this is my head canon for how things went okay we've talked Do about it. in the past how Fela and Lou has sort of agreed with this that this was what the thought was in his head as well yeah Fela was Alechia just mm-hmm. the previous time yeah I think that Fela Alechia was doing what she could to enforce her will and her definition of what it meant to be an elf on the rest of Elvendom and was not happy that Shosara was not towing that line. We know Alechia's temperament does not like being questioned, Yeah, does not like being stood up to in some regards. Authoritarians don't like that, no. My headcanon of what happened is that seeing the fracturing, seeing the potential loss of her power, especially in the face of you're such a tyrant, Mm -hmm. you're not representing us. We are elves, but the fact that we did this, blah, 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 you're such a tyrant. I think that her thought at that point was, really? Okay, well, I'll show you, and stepped (laughs) down, and Mm -hmm. then you get Liara on the throne, who is even worse. (laughs) You think, I'm a tyrant? Well, here you go. I'll show you who the real tyrant is. And I'm not sure who Liara was. It feels to me like Liara is a puppet of Alechia. Mm -hmm. That Liara could get away with doing things. Yeah. And brought the hammer down, Mm -hmm. stripped the Lariscova Rennell and any who backed them. Yep. Of their titles and their place at court, their place at court and basically stripped them and exiled them. Yeah, they were banished from the from the wood completely. The Lariscova is no longer in the wood. Mm -hmm. But then you know, on top of that, went on to be even more tyrannical and harsh and whatnot yeah. to the elves compared to Fela. Mm-hmm. So that when Fela comes back as, as Alechia, yep. she can be the same as she was, but <laughs> in contrast to the, the previous one. one, aren't I wonderful? <laughs> I feel like there was part of a... I'll show them to the other immortals 
because yeah. the other immortals knew what was going on, which mm-hmm. was, you're not liking the way I run things? Well, let me show you how bad it can be. Yeah. And then coming back and saying, okay, now, have you learned your lesson? <laughs> Do you understand what I what can, can really do and why you should, yeah. you know, that's my headcanon. I do not require people to adhere to that. It just makes a lot of sense given everything that happened within that span of several centuries yes. and what we kind of know about Alachia's temperament and how she deals with challenges to her authority and pride. Yes. It feels very authentic to me that that is the case. I don't disagree because Lou and you were, were of the same headspace. I had investigated uh, the garbage person that deeply, but I'm absolutely going to take your authority on that one because I am. So uh, after this, the Lariscova and any who side with him were banished by Queen Liara, Matriarch Ariane, and the entire Lariscova Renell decided that the Shosaran way was more prosperous now that they've blended with the humans and adopted things that worked and banished things and, and stopped doing things that didn't work and really made it harmonious for everyone to live there. Uh, they also decided that that at that point, the Bloodwood was the Bloodwood court was specifically corrupt. Yes. Corrupt in the classical sense, not in the earth on horror tainted <laughs> sense. I thank you. I applaud you for stepping in and correcting that one before I got anywhere further. That is an important distinction in this game. Yes, yes. Politically corrupt, yes. Despite everything, the attempt by the court to cut off Shosara as a way of conceivably like teaching them a lesson, saying that yeah. you are no longer elves, mm-hmm. which is just shitty, to be it's honest. A dick move. <laughs> did not have the total effect that I think Liara wanted because the other nations of the elven diaspora, we're talking Mm -hmm. again, like Seriatha, the Western kingdoms, those that were not in and of the wood itself. Yeah. Kind of disregarded the edict. Mm -hmm. There was a certain amount of loss of authority for the elven court at that time. And I think it's something that, feeds into, again, so much of what's going on with the Bloodwood and the tragedy of it and everything else, and Alecha's pride and desire to be the queen of everything, at mm-hmm. least the queen of everything elven. Yeah. And Shosara was kind of like, well, okay, I mean, we're doing fine. We're going to keep doing our thing. And then that Thera also arose in the aftermath of that as a result yes. of somebody el- of Messias being banished. Mm-hmm. And so Thera not really considering itself an elven nation, but absolutely becoming a sort of rival power in a sense oh, to yeah. the wood because it was founded by an exile indirectly or whatever. And again, There's a whole mess of immortal (laughs) elf politics that is going on behind the scenes there that we are not going to get into right now. (laughs) That's our seven part series for later on. Yeah, that's the situation is that this whole thing was a game. Game's not right. Not it was a power play. Yeah, I think that that Alachia was making and it didn't completely work out for her, which is, I think, highlights a point that I don't talk about very often, but I think is very true. And I talk Mm -hmm. about, I will probably talk about this more when we talk about Thera. And I think I've brought it up in the past in regards to Thera. And that is that while there may be ancients and immortals that are involved in the founding or in some of the behind the scenes Mm -hmm. situations of what's going on, there are lots of people involved that are not in on the conspiracy that aren't aware of the agendas and family squabbles that are going on at that higher level of things that are just going to go and do what they're going to do. Yeah. Regardless is that, yeah, you may be millennia old. Mm-hmm. Alechia, you may be one of the oldest living beings in bar safe, but that doesn't mean you can control everything that happens. No. Despite what you want might wish. <laughs> 
same goes for Thera, regardless of whatever the founding principles and ideas might have been for Thera Mm -hmm. a thousand years ago. There's a lot of people that are part of it, and they're going to be doing their own thing that has kind of changed the direction and the focus of it. Yeah, agreed. So speaking of the Therans, this is the part of the story for Shosara's founding where the Scourge was discovered to be on its way. And Shosara, as I mentioned earlier, had all of these uh, natural resources in the true elements that they could actually use to meet the demands for payment for the Therans uh, for the rights of protection and passage. And using their vast resources, were able to fashion a grand citadel, including all of the nearby outlying settlements and all of Kistova could be in this citadel. And as I said earlier, when I opened this, the show, was not breached. So they did it successfully. Yes. Now, it certainly helped, I think, in terms of this, that the overall population of Shosara and the surrounding communities, including Kistova, is overall kind of rather sparsely populated. Yes. It was not difficult to fashion a citadel that had enough space to accommodate all of those people. It also meant that all of the skill and knowledge and expertise of the people involved in the construction of it could all be focused on one thing, one place, Mm -hmm. rather than dividing their efforts in various locations. Agreed. So, yeah. It's a tough situation. Like, there is value in being able to devote all of your resources to constructing a single haven as strong as you possibly can. Mm Mm-hmm. But the downside of that is, is that if something happens, then you're all Toast. gone. There's <laughs> no situation where, like in Bar Save, you've got these scattered settlements, some of which mm-hmm. survived, some of which didn't, because the population was so scattered that they couldn't all be annihilated. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I also think that in part because of the remoteness of the area – Despite being a probably pretty strong magical beacon in astral space, I don't think there were enough horrors in the area to do the kind of dedicated focus on it that would have happened in other areas like Thera or the Bloodwood. Yeah. I think, Mm -hmm. again, the remoteness and sparseness of the population worked in their favor in ways that it didn't in other parts of the lands known by the Theron Empire. Agreed. Agreed. So since they made it through the Scourge and really became more bonded to one another, the cultures that were in there, as we've t- t- talked about before, the, me- the melting pot and the interblending of elven culture, human culture, all the other settlements that were there. Yeah. Uh, after Even more than had already happened, at, you know, over the course of the, the previous generations. Centuries. Absolutely. So, yeah, they, they did their thing. After the Scourge, Shosara basically reestablished its trade routes, small settlements, and contact with the outside world, picking up right where they left off in complete stark contrast to the Bloodwoods' isolationist policy. So they decided to go in the absolute opposite direction. And the aftermath of the Scourge and the discovery of what had happened to the Elven Court and to Wormwood has led factions within Shosara to move to even further removing and undercutting the authority of the Elven Court, basically making the argument that by what they did to themselves, they are no longer elves. Yes. And that as uncorrupted descendants of the wood, they are the ones that are best suited to carry on the traditions of Elvendom, which, of course, broadly speaking, would mean that there is a more open, loose, liberal attitude towards Mm -hmm. what it means to be an elf. It's like the strict followers versus the loose followers of the wheel. Yeah. Shosara as a nation are loose followers. There are things that they consider elven, Mm -hmm. and a big part of that is just their culture as it has developed over the centuries. Totally. 
and taking on aspects of the Kostovan folk or the other people that were in the area does not make them any less elven as a result. In fact, in some ways, maybe even makes them stronger. Agreed. Again, kind of playing into a, a theme that shows up quite frequently in Earth Dawn, and that is that the strength of diversity and bringing multiple disparate peoples together mm-hmm. to take advantage of the various strengths rather than what you end up with for a more monocultural thought, where we yeah. see the weaknesses of that in, for example, the Bloodwood, mm-hmm. in the Crystal Raiders, the yeah. kind of monoculture and problems that they have as a result of their singular nature and the culture that has grown up around the environment that they're in, especially with the more extreme ends of it, like the blood lords and whatnot, who are unwilling to accept anything other than the purity of their ways as they see them. Yeah. Even to a certain extent, the more conservative elements of the kingdom of Thrall who mm-hmm. want Thrall for the dwarves and are not happy with the way that Varalus and Needon to a certain extent constructed the inner cities and opened the kingdom up to others mm-hmm. from outside orcs yes. and humans and everybody, everybody. <laughs> It is a tale as old as time. Yes. That you are dealing with there. Then you've got that coupled with Sariatha, who we will talk about in more depth in several episodes. We're going to spend a little bit more time in Shosara. Yes. But it's just that's the kind of situation that Shosara is making the bid and making the argument that while the Western kingdoms are also a good example of Elvendom, They were not descended from those who left the wood in pursuit of a holy vision from Jaspery. Yes. Um, That, yes, they are an elven people, but they don't have the lineage or legacy. And to be fair, there is also a certain amount of hand rubbing and schadenfreude on the part of the Lariscova Rennell at the potential ability for them to stick it to the court uh, yeah. And what was done to them previously. Oh, yeah. There's a little bit of um, what they feel is perhaps a little bit of, of justified, ironic revenge that could come about if they managed to pull this off. I was going to use that exact three word phrase. Justified, ironic revenge. <clears throat> uh, so that's the founding of Shosar. Let's get into a little, just a smidgen of the uh, geography of it. Uh, we'll get to some more details later on. So uh, surrounding Shosara, as I said before, are the untamed lands. Plants here, because this is Earth Dawn, tend to grow a little bit bigger and at a faster rate. So uh, loggers cut down trees and they grow back a whole lot faster in these lands than they do other places. Because again, they I'm guessing because their citadel was successful, that the lands here are less despoiled by the horrors then. Yeah, there's others. that. I'm sure there is also the legacy and tradition of elven magic in terms of interacting with woods and the plants and forests. And it could also just be a natural aspect of the terrain where there is so much natural magical resources. Yes. That can help supercharge what is going on there. Yeah. And that as a relatively speaking newer settlement, it has not had its resources exploited to the degree that Barsafe has. Yes. Agreed. Uh, by the way, the weather here is more unpredictable. Uh, animals also grow bigger and are fiercer. So if you do ac- come across any in the water, and that's a big thing, and on the land in this area, beware of those things. Um, and it's also even mentioned that the geography here of the land itself is uh, claimed to shift and change. And so if you visit a place, the landmarks will change the next time you go to visit that place. It could be a week, could be a year. Yes. One of those things. So this is the shifting lands up around Shosara as well. Uh, there are four otherwise main points of interest. The Western Fens, the Grand Cataracts, the Plains of the East, and the Frigid North. I'll break those down. The Western Fens basically uh, have craggy shores that lead to deep, thick forest, eventually getting into lakes and bogs. So you've got other terrains to go explore there. The Grand Cataracts are more of a beachy shore as you traverse the, the Gwyn Sea, leading to more dense forest. 
However, these have these end in high cliffs, fast, rapid rivers, and rocky foothills. So more kind of like the Twilight Peaks. Then there's the plains of the east. This forest doesn't go far. It transitions into farmland, and after that, it is open plains as far as the eye can see from Kistova on eastward is where all this starts. So that's where you can find a lot of uh, true air. And then you have, of course, the frigid north. This are, these are snow-capped trees, to Josh's point, evergreens, uh, that give uh, way quickly to a vast icy plain like Greenland <laughs> Yeah, type. This is, again, real-world equivalent. This is the yeah. Arctic Circle north of the Scandinavian peninsula. Yeah. The Sami people are the indigenous folk in that area. It does not have the somewhat sheltered environment that the Gwyn Sea and the Shosaran Peninsula have mm-hmm. in terms of that large landmass protecting them. They are on the shores of the Arctic Sea, of yeah. the Sea of Ice, as they call it. And everything that blows around up in that part of the world will just hammer the coastline and and is incredibly in, uh, in uninhabitable. Yeah. So... It's amazing. So uh, very well done on the surrounding areas as well to at least give you three or four different locales and geographical terrain to make some other adventures in and flesh those out as you wish. The Gwyn Sea, by the way, runs very deep, except for some certain places down south. Uh, Very windy, very stormy. Most places to uh, to shore up can be reached in four to seven days, as I said before. Lots of sea life in this sea. So... You get to use any underwater creatures from the from the creatures book uh, that haven't been explored much. If you're doing all land things or all river things, this is where you get to use all the, the creatures that are big enough, like the Salachi, that go into the seas. So by all means. And of course, you cannot miss the Villa, the earth equivalent of mermaids, as nasty yeah. as they ever have been. So by all means. The thing that I like about what ended up being Shosara in this book has to do with the distant horizons Mm -hmm. because there is not a lot of space in this book, relatively speaking, to provide a lot of detail about Shosara and the surrounding area. You kind of have just impressions of things and, and what is out there. Off to the east, we've got vast plains with high grass and that's beyond a certain point. We don't know what's out there. Yeah. To the north, as well as to the west, Mm-hmm. terrain and and an environment that has resources that are worth getting, but there are also dangerous other people out there that are not really detailed in, in a huge extent. Yeah. Just little hints and pieces. It's enough to work with. The Grand Cataracts actually connect, not truly connect, but the source of the Serpent River is yeah. in that area. There is a very different feel here than you have in Bar Save. Bar yeah. Save, while it does have its unique aspects, feels like a largely familiar and traditional Western fantasy thing. Yeah. It's not medieval Europe, but it does have a lot of features of the classic Lord of the Rings slash D&D ish yeah. fantasy setting. Shosara is is similar to that in some regards, but also has a lot more of a magical, wild energy. I think like, honestly, the Savage Land from Marvel Comics. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Which is in Antarctica in the Marvel Comics, Mm -hmm. but is this area that is this primeval, wild land that is still vibrant, rich and growing and whatnot. Things like Conan Doyle's The Lost World. Oh, totally. You know, where you've got the plateau that has these forgotten things. Skull Island from King Kong. Mm -hmm. You know, again, giant, strange beasts with a lot of weird, unusual things that you might encounter out there. Yeah. It is one of the things that I like to see with regards to areas outside of Barsave being developed, and that is to have them have a a certain flavor of their own Mm -hmm. so that they don't necessarily feel like this is just bar save redone. Yeah. There is enough of a historical and cultural connection to bar save that that is sort of still there, 
but the further a field you get, the more different I feel like things should be. Yeah, this is like parent is bar save, offspring is Shosara, because it's related to, has a has an earth on feel to it, but it's its own thing. Yeah, in a sense, it just there's a lot more, for lack of a better term, like wild magic energy. Yeah, that is going on in this corner of the world. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. I, and I kind of like that. I, I was going to say, this is my favorite, er, this is my favorite elven setting because the blood would I find stifling. Um, yeah. Dark and brooding, which isn't necessarily my personality. I could understand people would love that and I got no problem with it. It should exist there. This is the one I would rather play in because it's more open-ended, less claustrophobic. That's just me. So otherwise, I did find the my my favorite little nugget in here is that between Shosara and uh, Kistova, there is an annual feast. Didn't give a date. So the game master can play with this date all you want. That there is a feast of the new dawn. And it's annual. This is uh, where they do a regatta, a boat race between uh, uh, elves and humans. They each take their best ship and their best crew and they go on a boat race through the sea. I love that idea. Just the fact that they've blended well enough now that they have a friendly competition, but it's always the Feast of the New Dawn, tying back into the Earth Dawn name of the game. That's just a nice touch. Gotta say. So uh, the last detail to notice, uh, pretty much the last two, is the Eye of Gwyn Island in the Gwyn Sea. This is the headquarters of some questers of Jaspery. The weather there is actually always nice. A little hard to get to, though. Not a big thing. And then there's the gullet. This is the passage to the Sea of Ice to the north. And that is more treacherous. Has a nice legend about a uh, mysterious castle that might be somewhere in the middle of that as well. Um, Game masters can play with that as you wish. Have fun with that. But this is, I think, a a well-developed offspring of the Earth Dawn map in its own right. Welcome to Shosara. I really like what was done with this chapter. I don't remember exactly who did the bulk of the work on Shosara, whether it was Kyle or Michael or Carl. I don't remember exactly how things got divided up for them to get this book taken care of, but I really like Shosara and kind of like Vasgothia, it's an area that I think would be really cool to see more exploration and expansion of yeah but bar save is the core is the popular setting and stuff outside of that just doesn't draw as much love attention yeah fair so uh any final thoughts on this no but i remember reading through this when we were developing this book back like six or seven years ago uh, at this point And just being really happy with what came about and how evocative Shosara is with the limited amount of space that it's given. And we're going to talk about it at least for one, if not two more episodes. Absolutely. This is a good overview. And if you haven't looked at it before, check out the Elven Nations book. Check out this chapter and get a really different taste compared to what you often encounter in Barsave. Absolutely. So until next time, uh, make this episode the annual Feast of the New Dawn for your legend. Good night, everybody. 